on behalf of my partner, Frank Steele, who's the headmaster of Chestnut Hill Academy, we would like to welcome you to the address presentation. We both have had the honor of meeting Chris Lehman uh, because we have used him with our faculty and his presentation has been so exciting and have generated such buzz that we are thrilled to actually have him in person and to meet him in person. I'd like to take a moment and thank all of our tech teams because they are live streaming and I think this is a first for an Advis produ uh, production uh, presentation. It is the second time we've done it. We, when Justice Breyer came to the schools, we were able to live stream and then to watch as our families clicked on to, to see him and to participate in an event that was closed to all other adults. So it was a very exciting way to virtually include all of our communities. And I think it is a testament not only to Chris, but to our engagement in 21st century education that we have such an amazing audience today. So thank you all for coming very much. Thank you very much. Good morning and welcome to all of you. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to ask you to turn your cell phones to vibrate. I'm not going to ask you to turn them off because I'd love for you all to Twitter all morning. Um, but if you could at least put them on vibrate, that would be great. I would like to thank Springside School for hosting our event this morning and for arranging to live stream this presentation so that a wider audience can have the chance to hear Chris today. How many of you have heard of TED? I bet many of you. Um, I love TED. TED is where I first saw Chris Lehman. After that, I kept seeing his name popping up on Twitter and on conference agendas and such things. And I realized that he's right in our backyard in Philadelphia. Part of my job is to seek out great speakers and bring them to Advis. I wanted all of you to be able to hear Chris talk about thoughtful 21st century school reform and about some of the things that he's been able to accomplish at his school. Chris Lehman is the founding principal of science, the Science Leadership Academy, a progressive science and technology high school, which is a joint venture between the Franklin Institute and the School District of Philadelphia. The Science Leadership Academy is an inquiry-driven, project-based, one-to-one laptop school that is considered to be one of the pioneers of the School 2.0 movement nationally and internationally. SLA has been recognized as an Apple Distinguished School <coughs> and was named one of the 10 <coughs> most amazing schools in Ladies Home Journal. It has also been written about in many publications, including Edutopia Magazine, Ed Week, and of course the Philadelphia Inquirer. Among his many honors, Chris was named one of the 30 most influential people in EdTech by Technology and Learning Magazine in June of 2010. He has shared his vision with educators all over the country. Chris is the author of the EduBlog Practical Theory, which if you'd like to follow it is www.practicaltheory.org, and is the father to Jacob and Theo. Please join me in welcoming Chris Lehman. Thank you. It's, uh, it's quite an honor to be here. Um, what I do love talking about is this idea of School 2.0, um, the idea that we need to kind of change what we're doing and what we are. Um, first, uh, Theo Maggiana is the only one that comes and so happens to be part of the Practical Institute, um, which is every now and then Darth Vader shows up in your building. Uh, by the way, you've never actually seen a riot in, your, in a school until you see Boba Fett walk your halls. Uh, it's wonderful. We, this was, how many people got to see the Star Wars exhibit a while back at the Franklin? A couple folks, right? So I don't know if you were there one of the days when um, the fighting 501st, Vader's Fist, the guys who dress up in the whole costumes came by. So they were there for the exhibit a lot and Darth Vader did come to our school. Um, I am the founding principal of SLA. Uh, my background is that before coming to, back to Philadelphia, I'm a Philly area native, went to school in the Burbs, college in the city, um, and was in New York City for about 10 years at a progressive high school in New York City called the Beacon School. And um, I had always kept my eye on small school reform in Philadelphia, wondering if they were ever gonna get around to it. And then this very brief window of time, uh, about six or seven years ago, Paul Ballas decided it was a good idea and uh, put out a press release on ASCD Daily and I saw it, wrote up a one-pager on what I thought a school could be, started shopping it around, found out that the Franklin was also talking to the district about what a school could be, and 
we kind of came together and decided that we had a lot of the same ideas and um, created SLA. If you would have told me six years ago that um, we would be where we are today, I wouldn't have believed you, which goes to show you that things are possible. Um, and it was this kind of crazy window in time. I'm sure all of you read the same papers I do. Dr. Ackerman, while being a big fan of SLA, has kind of moved away from the small schools movement in Philly. So we've managed to get in in a very short window to start something that we're really proud of. Now, why this stuff matters and why I'm not in my school today The important reason is up in the upper right hand corner, and uh, that is Jacob and Theo. Jacob's the one with the Mickey Mouse shirt, Theo is the one with the glasses. Um, my children are hitting school age. Jacob is in first grade at Greenfield Elementary in the city, uh, Theo is, is still in uh, preschool. We watched last year. Jacob is the child, Jacob and Theo both, are the children of English majors. So our house is filled with books, and we were the parents who read to our children, you know, in utero and what have you. Um, yes, you all know those parents. Um, we watched last year Jacob go from someone who loved books to becoming, to starting down a path of, a, of being a non-reader. And we watched that happen through the rigors of kindergarten. You laugh. We don't. Um, he was sent home last year with about 30 to 40 minutes of homework every single night in kindergarten. You know, get up, you know, we've got to, and literally we heard the, we've got to start prepping for the tests in kindergarten. And his teacher, who was a very caring, very dedicated educator, did the 100 book challenge. The 100 book challenge turned into the 570 book challenge, and that's, not an, that's no exaggeration. And what happened was is she made it competitive, right? And there was the whole chart on the wall and who's winning and who's losing. Well, my child um, probably plays soccer against some of the children uh, of people here in this school, um, got competitive. And so he was bringing home eight to 10 books a night. And these were those leveled readers. How many people know the leveled readers? Right, you know, Johnny goes to the supermarket. Johnny goes to the baseball field over and over and over again. Deathly boring. And he did it because he was told. He's a good kid. He does what he's told. And he did it because he was told, read as many books as you can. He was never told to love it. He was never told to enjoy it. So we were horrified when, during the year, Jacob started saying, I hate books. Now, we got him back a little bit. In fact, yesterday, I tweeted out a picture. I was doing the laundry upstairs, and I came down with classic Philly row home, and Jacob was sitting on the bottom, or sitting about midway down the steps, reading books, just that we, because we just leave books everywhere. They're like, you can't, you know, how to fall over books. And he was like, and I caught him. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is great. And he's like, well, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just reading. You know, and it was like, I don't really want to admit to this. But we were all excited, so we're getting him back. How do we get him back? One, Shel Silverstein, still a big fan. Um, poetry, Mo Willems, good stories. And then the other thing, how many people have heard of Fable Vision? Anyone in the room? Couple, one, two, three people. Peter and Paul Reynolds, this amazing uh, duo of artists and storytellers. Um, created Fable Vision, and they actually have apps that are book apps. And they're interactive and wonderful and great because Jacob will do anything if it's on a laptop, an iPad, an iTouch. And so we got him back that way as well. The other thing is Theo, you know, his glasses. He was three when that picture was taken. Your average three-year-old doesn't have glasses. He's going to have an IEP. He already has one. Which means as we go through the public system, my single greatest fear for him is that a teacher is going to look at him and think, I gotta get this kid to pass the test? I never want my child to be looked at as a disaggregated subgroup. I want him looked at as Theo. For all of the creative, wonderful, weird, flawed, and awesome things that he is. But that's the way we're looking at kids in the public schools today. The next reason I think this is important is the picture up in the upper left-hand corner. 
which is I've been incredibly lucky over the last five or six years. I've been able to talk to teachers all over this country. Everybody that I talk to, or almost everybody I talk to, has a real sense of unease, that something's wrong and they can't name it. I was in Austin, Texas this month, and 200 and some odd people in an audience, and I asked them, raise your hand if you think your school's getting 100% right. No one. 90% right. 80% right. 70% right. A couple hands. 60% right. A couple more hands. 50% right. Tentative hands. And I stopped there because I didn't want to get depressed. <clears throat> Teachers know something's wrong. Teachers have a sense that there's an unease, that something isn't the way it used to be. But they can't quite figure out why. So that's the other reason this is really important to me. And the last reason why is, of course, that's the class of SLA. That's our first class. They graduated in, the, in um, June. Um, They're all off at college, or 97% of them are off at college now. Um, they're at schools all over this country, and now they just keep bugging us that, it, that they're bugging me to start a college, and I keep saying to them, no. <laughs> but if you ever want to be humbled, start a school. We had 120 families say, we will trust you with our most precious possession, our children, when we were a, when we were a construction site. Literally, we had our first meeting in the Franklin Institute in the basement in Harcourt, where they always have all the kids. And I had to sit there and say, yes, I promise the building will be open, you know, September. You know, I swear. I swear. Really, I mean it. And the story of getting that building open was something amazing. But the funny thing is this, which is that I don't care if you are at a school with a 250-year history. I don't care if you're at a school that just opened last week. The idea that parents send us their most precious resources, their children, should drive us and humble us every single day. They send us their best. They don't leave the good ones at home. So that idea should drive us. And the thing that I like talking about is this idea, what should our schools be about then? And why aren't they that way? I'm going to cop to three biases. The first, and I just out of curiosity, how many people have read John Dewey? About 35% of the room. How many people have read him since graduate school? Okay, about 1% of the room. I think this is easier than we make it sometimes. I really think that the path is there for us. I really think this idea of School 2.0 is just progressive tools, uh, progressive schooling with cool tools. I am, I, my parents always get happy when I say this, and since you're broadcasting it, I'll cop to it today. Um, I am the most derivative human being ever. I am the child of a, of a school teacher and a union lawyer. So all of my ideas, my parents sat in on one of my speeches one time and they sat in the back going, you think you guys think he invented these ideas? No, he heard them from us. Thank you. <laughs> but in the 1970s, in the mid-1970s, my mom taught in Camden, New Jersey for many, many years. And in the 70s, she got a grant. tell their stories. And in 1975, 76, my mom did. And they were using the old big, you know, the old cameras with film and they had to cut them and do all of that stuff. And of course it took forever. And the products were <laughs> right? I mean let's be honest, that's what it looked like back then. And that was part of the knock. It was always very, very easy to knock progressive education because the projects took forever and they didn't look all that great. Well the tools have caught up. What our kids can do today with a flip cam and a laptop isn't so far off from Scorsese. I mean, you know, technically, but, you know. What our kids can do, I mean, the TED Talk uh, that Stacy referenced um, was shot in New York City at the TEDx, TEDx, and it was filmed by SLA kids. And it's the most professional looking production like you can imagine. And it was eight kids and a teacher who cared. And they managed the whole thing and you would have never known it was any different from anything that NBC or CBS would have done. 